hello. I'm incredibly sorry not to be there with you at this year's Ojai Festival, and particularly to be for Mark Morris's incredible and inventive programming, all music that I uh, very profoundly affectionate towards. But anyway, uh, I'm sorry I can't be there, but I'm here to say a few informal and disorganized words about what I'm planning for 2014. We were very secretive last year when we were talking about uh, the festival. I think it is more possible to be upfront about the one of the centerpieces of 2014 will be this opera based on Charles Rosen's book, The Classical Style. Uh, in case you don't know Charles Rosen, Charles Rosen, uh, pianist, thinker, polymath, he, he knew everything. Uh, I'm very sorry to say that he passed away last December, and I was very close to him the last couple of years of his life, uh, and I always admired the classical style, and many musicians do, uh, as a book that kind of brings to life the wonders of Mozart, Haydn, and Beethoven. And about five years ago or so, I actually wrote down one, <laughs> one night in, in my uh, notebook an idea for an opera based on the classical style. And what I've sort of jokingly described as the first and last opera about musical analysis. And there's something, of course, intrinsically nerdy about this whole prospect. But it, once I drew up the, the cast of characters, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, Charles Rosen, the tonic, the dominant, various other principles of composition, the purple patch, uh, anything that happens in the classical work, uh, if you sort of made elements of music into musical characters, what kind of opera would that turn out to be? Uh, and what, you know, what fun it could be to have Mozart uh, appear as a character in the opera and then s sing in Mozartian ways and in ways that are like a caricature of, of, <laughs> of Mozart and Beethoven. And I s began immediately imagining a sort of enraged Beethovenian uh, arias and, and uh, very jokey Haydn-esque, all the things, the sort of stereotypes that we use for these great composers that have become uh, <laughs> impossible to separate from them. Uh, and if you had all these sort of stereotypes running around stage and operatically arguing with each other, what, what would it be like? What would be the possibilities? And also, like, what's the possibility of, of bringing some of Charles's incredible analyses and insights about this music uh, to life? Like, actually, something like a great talk on music made into, in, into drama. Uh, and there's also an element in, in Charles's book that, I, that I've always felt, which is... The story of the book is basically how did the style, which was so defined and so amazing, and which kind of almost defines what we mean by classical music, how did the style kind of emerge out of the chaos, you know, from like the death of Bach and Handel to 1770? There's sort of this weird zone of time when there's no music that seems to really clearly be able to use the principles of harmony. Um, and Charles goes on and on about this, and then how these composers at first began to sort of figure out the possibilities of the language and then it sort of flowers into this amazing golden era of music and but then uh, you know of course we have Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven and by 1825 uh, this music is already out of fashion the style is out of fashion the world is moving on and the language in a way even even in late Beethoven pieces you can see he has this sense that the language that he's been using is no longer possible and there are principles actually you know it's a sort of part of the classical style is that uh, it uses a certain set of conventions to express itself, but it's constantly trying to destroy those conventions at the same time. So it's kind of a music historical story, the creation of a language and the destruction of a language and the, and the impossibility of speaking in that, that perfect language forever. So <laughs> hopefully all these themes and ideas will be in the opera. I'm so incredibly thrilled that uh, Stephen Stuckey has agreed to write the music, and he immediately saw the, of course, the humorous potential and the incredible fun of writing music about music. Um, <clears throat> sort of riffing off that, you can see that maybe a theme of the festival is sort of screwing with the canon, uh, <laughs> which I do only because I think it's a way to keep some of the canon, the music that we love, fresh is not to treat it with stifling respect. To that end, uh, Thursday night, uh, we've invited Yuri Kane, who's 
unbelievable genius, uh, in my opinion. And I've always loved this album of his about Mahler. It's, I believe it's called Primal Light. And he sort of explodes elements of Mahler that we consider to be like postmodern, the collage element of Mahler, how Mahler brings together uh, the, the profound and the profane, the, the most idiotic materials and the most um, sublime. And, and Yuri kind of runs with that element of Mahler and makes it into something really bizarre and postmodern and, and shocking. Uh, and if you listen, there's a famous, for me, famous uh, Adagietto of the Fifth Symphony, where this beautiful music keeps kind of drifting out as if a radio signal um, gets lost and you, you, you wander into another kind of nightmarish music and you come back to Mahler and, and it keeps drifting in and out of, of, of a kind of musical consciousness. So uh, Yuri Kane sort of sc screwing with Mahler, if you will, uh, and he teases out, of course, the, the Jewish elements in Mahler and lets them really become the klezmer they, they've always uh, wanted to be. Uh, I believe a cantor is coming. So Thursday night, uh, sort of arriving at, at Yuri's great treatment of Mahler, and Yuri's going to do something very clever with the Goldberg canons. Bach wrote these 14 canons on the first eight bass notes of the Goldberg variations. And they begin very simply with sort of almost like a lesson in how you write a canon, or a lesson in the possibilities of those eight bass notes, that they go together forwards and backwards. And if you turn them upside down, they do the same thing. And Bach starts with the sort of basic building blocks of musical thought, and then he keeps adding perversities. Uh, I keep using that word. He keeps adding perverse chromaticisms, the most outlandish things, and making the canon work by sheer, of course, Bach genius. And, and I love the, the pull of, of, uh, of simplicity and bizarreness in those canons. And so that Sunday morning, there's going to be a whole program of canons, sort of punning on screwing with the canon. Uh, Mozart scatological canons, Joscan canon, uh, Thomas Addis, uh, Nan Caro, a whole, a whole morning of canons, hopefully some very profound and some incredibly bawdy and naughty. Uh, the, uh, another composer who loved screwing with the canon, of course, is Charles Ives, and Saturday morning, for sure, we're going to have a big Ives program, including violin sonatas played by my brilliant younger colleague, Stefan Jakiv, who is one of my favorite violinists, and uh, who plays with an incredible combination of, of brain and heart, and, of course, staggering technique. Um, that's music, of course, that I've spent a lot of time with. Ives is a, is a thing of mine, and there will be Ives running through Saturday as well, and also performances of, uh, we're bringing a lot of the sort of younger Brooklyn composers, Andrew Norman, Timo Andres, uh, Judd Greenstein. I, I, there's going to be a whole Brooklyn <laughs> representation on Saturday. Uh, and that is, well, the, um, the Ligeti Etudes which is music that I've spent a lot of time with. Hopefully that <coughs> will be on Sunday evening's concert. I'll play books one and two of the Ligeti Etudes, which are, of course, full of canons and bizarre, bizarre contrapuntal possibilities. Well, those are some of the, uh, the I guess, highlights or lowlights or whatever you want to say of the 2014 Ojai Festival. Uh, yeah, and I can't wait to see how this, uh, <laughs> can't wait to see how this opera takes shape.